Hey guys, this is Coach Keita Bussey with 180 Farms Training, joined today by Sam Patrick Callahan and Christian Seiler. Welcome to the 180 Farms Training Podcast. All right, Christian, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Well, I guess this is a slightly new introduction now, but my name is Christian Seiler. I'm an IPSC world champion in the open division, uh, USPSA national champion, been shooting, learned a few things. I'm half decent and uh, just got back from the world championship and excited to kind of sit down, talk about that, talk about a lot of things, talk about whatever. But um, yeah, first podcast after the world shoot, doing well, won the match. So it's a good time. So doing well. I like that little Woo-hoo! title change here. Congratulations. Like, what, not, what, a world, not a world what, title. Say. Not a world title. You're the world champion until what, 2025? Uh, I mean, I don't I don't plan on stopping there, but yes, you are correct. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> I like it. I like it. And it's going to be like in it. South Africa. It will be. Very excited. Very excited about that. I'll have to get the inside scoop from uh, from you guys and uh, also mm-hmm. some South Africans. So I'm definitely excited for that. Oh, yeah. They love their like half sized targets and making them swingers. Like the kind where you can barely get one pass. It's like, boom, 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 only at the height. Sounds like frost proof. I'm up for it. <laughs> yeah. And it's like way you have to activate at the beginning and it's all the way at the end. So you can either wait till you get down there or try and take it right away when it's like. Boom. We'll make that choice when we get there. Till then, I'll just keep right. practicing them. That will be easy by then. He'll have swingers in the pocket, I think, by that. He'll be all right. There we go. We're getting better every time shoot. World shoot, man. Seeing swingers on, on sliders was a, a cool thing to see. And it was kind of interesting. Crazy. Yeah, it was interesting to watch some of that match video of yours of just one, yeah. two. Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, I'm just you, like, call them, you call them good and you're done. I actually think um, those weren't that bad, I think. The harder ones I faced were early on in the year at the Pan Am. Those ones, you, you almost had to lead a little bit with the open gun, and they were incredibly fast. But uh, I think that prepared me pretty well. The ones the world shoot weren't that bad, but uh, I actually ended up buying a plate swinger and a uh, faster swinger. And so I have two swingers and a uh, plate swinger. So I set those up in the hardest configurations and shot them over and over and over and over again. And, but I uh, bet they weren't yeah. sliding. <laughs> They were not sliding. They were not sliding. Luckily, one of the practice matches had one, and I shot it. And I was expecting it to be really hard. I was like, oh, this can be a huge advantage to shoot and stuff. But I shot it, and on the first time, I shot six out of the six shots on it. I was like, oh, this is kind of a letdown. I'm not really going to gain much here at all. So, um, But, yeah, it did look a little scarier under the gun than I initially thought, um, just because of how tight the targets were. But, yeah, lots of movers at the world shoot, lots of some you know, some good challenging stuff for sure, um, but didn't really feel outclassed by any of the, the difficulty, seeming that the Pan Am was hard and the training was hard. So uh, yeah. it was a good match. I did see on your first-person perspective video you – watched one of the sliders going to your left and you took your shots and it was your last target. You kind of sat there like, uh, do I take another shot? Uh, no. <laughs> it maybe was, um, if it was the really tight one at the end of the stage, the last yeah. target going left to right, I shot one and then I thought I was going to shoot one going over the top, but it kind of arced a little faster than I expected, faster than the one that I shot in practice. But I was planning a third shot at the other dwell. The safest shots were left dwell, right dwell, not shooting over the top. And to get from top dwell to, to bottom was almost no time. So I shot left and then right. And the right's the riskiest shot because you're, the no shoot's on the left-hand side. Mm-hmm. You have, if you have any physical fundamental uh, problem, you have a bad grip. Because the, especially because the visual impulse is telling you, you know, tighten up. Oh my gosh, this is a tight shot. If you have any problem, those shots are going left. Any, even so, tension, it's going to send anything. it left. Anything could set. Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. There's definitely a lot of factors that could send it left, including what you're talking about. And, uh, but yeah, just, just shot the other one, stayed relaxed, stayed with good trigger prep, maintained the grip that I had, and the shot was there. But I expected that I potentially needed more. I mean, some people were shooting four or five shots at that target, um, but I want to shoot as, as few shots as possible with the most accurate shots as possible because every shot that I put down range is another shot that I can hit a no shoot and I keep adding time. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So I yeah. did notice a change in you as well. So in the beginning, you were sending more shots, and then mm-hmm. toward the end, you were like trusting yourself more. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I definitely uh, deal with pressure very well and I like that. And I think it really amps me up, but I think at a certain level, sometimes that can, uh, you know, make you second guess what you're shooting and can get your heart rate real fast. And I work on, you know, slowing that down a little bit. 
but no one can really recreate the the pressure of the first stage of the world shoot. And I think I managed it really, really well. I saw a lot of people really freaking mm -hmm. out. I think externally, I always look good, cool, calm, and collected no matter what's going on, which I think is really important and having that, yeah. that mindset. But yeah, first stage was, was a lot of stuff going on, a lot of impulses going on. So I sent a few extra rounds on the first stage, notably because I thought I was shooting the wall because the little wiggly bridge didn't get all the way left and right exactly where I wanted. So I sent yeah. a few extra shots. And then what's funny about that is, yeah, yeah and, I, and I'm confident in not putting those, I mean, I had all the, all the hits on it and missed a single shot on that one. I think after that, the only really extra shots that I had were on um, the two targets at like 40, 45 yards. And the only reason why I did that is because three shooters that are really, really good got really bad points on it. And externally, I was like, all right. I know I think that I'm a, a pretty good shooter and a pretty good shot. I know that's my bread and butter and I like the challenge. I like pushing shots off. And I don't think that's that challenging, um, but I was like, if they're having problems, what is the harm of shooting one more shot on this, especially this early in the match? And so putting a little bit of insurance on that, on that early on in the match, I think was totally okay. But I go walk out there and I have three alpha on both targets. I'm like, you know, the confidence <laughs> building thing. And no then you many, started trusting yourself. Yes, yeah. yes. No matter how many times Love you do it. that in practice, until you start really painting the canvas uh, and having an outline, I don't think you can fully kind of feel as confident as you want. But I think every match is a new canvas. And I'm not a painter, so I don't want to say this is how it is. But I'm sure it's a little daunting when you have a blank canvas in front of you. But as soon as you outline something and you know that your brush strokes are good and you're doing well, uh, then it's easier to fill it in. You're more confident taking more aggressive strokes on the on the canvas. So that's kind of how I feel about it. So you mentioned you came into that first stage cool, calm, and collected. Mm -hmm. Not only is that good for you, you know, you're calming yourself, getting ready, getting in your mental state, getting your visualization. Mm -hmm. That also messes with your competitors because they look over yeah. and they're freaking out. Like, this is the world shooter. It's the first stage. And they look at you and you're just like chilling. The kid's got ice in his veins. So like, <laughs> oh, oh God, I'm not ready for this. <laughs> you're not wrong, Sam. It's it's funny you say that. And so for me, I, I want, obviously I want to do the best myself and I want everyone around me to do the best possible so i don't try to make anyone feel uncomfortable um if you ask anyone that you shot with the world shoot or any other match i never say anything to take anyone down i always try to uplift people i want to beat people at their best um it means nothing to me to have someone you know lose on a jam it means nothing to me to have someone go up there rattled i want them to shoot their best and feel their best and at the end of the day they really can't do anything mm -hmm. differently so um i definitely don't try to do stuff like that but i know that when i walk up to that stage confidently i stomp two times in the ground ground myself get all nice and stretched out, you know, arms loose, feeling, you know, big and strong on the stage. I know that probably does mess with some people's heads a little bit, but uh, I wasn't, I wasn't not nervous. I wasn't not feeling the pressure, but I felt really confident in my preparation going to the first stage, but no matter how confident you feel, no matter how many times you shot those targets, 35, 40 yards further than what you're doing, how many times you shot smaller targets at further distances, faster swingers and all that sort of stuff in more awkward it's positions. Not, it wasn't the world shoot wasn't the world shoot you didn't have your heart pumping out of your chest you didn't mm -hmm. have all the you know your vision gets a little narrow it almost feels like um mm -hmm. you know the impulses feel always weird and and gun feels more violent you can never really uh you know you never really fully prepare for that but i feel like i prepare the, prepare the best that i possibly can and uh, i try to not let the outside factors i mean i put my almost my entire life on hold for this i took almost a month off from work i've been working you know shooting five six days a week i've never done that put a lot of things to the sideline to prepare for this match. But I'd really try not to let that get into my mindset. When I get into that match, it puts undue pressure on it. And I know that's still there. You can mm -hmm. never block that out. But at that moment on that stage, the only thing I'm thinking about is shooting holes in the center of cardboard targets and shooting steel, you know, right on, right on point. So yeah. that's basically how I feel. And th this was your first international match, right? It was. You know, I like to say the Pan Am was my first international match because I met, you know, a lot of Brazilians, people from Argentina, some people from the Philippines. But that was in Florida. But that was in Florida. I mean, when I was yeah. on Frostproof Range, I might as well have been in another country. But as soon as you leave the range, it's Frostproof Florida. I've been there four or five times before. I know it's the U.S. Well, yeah, the but, thing but is, fun. I mean, you're in Seattle. There's a two-hour time difference, but it's not the mm -hmm. same kind of jet lag as going to Thailand. Yeah. No. <laughs> How was the jet lag for you? The jet lag wasn't terrible. Um, I mean, when I first got there, I wanted, I was exhausted by six o'clock and I was waking up at like two, three in the morning, like go back to bed, um, you know, but I actually adjusted to the jet lag just fine. One, because I can fall asleep. Like 
If you guys, uh, if I muted you guys and I laid back in this chair, I could probably fall asleep because I burned the candle on both ends. And I also have some mm -hmm. sleep interruptions. These are my tonsils I had strip um, a week, week and a half before USPSA Nationals. I'm actually getting them removed in a month from now. I tried to have them oh, out wow. before the world shoot, but it's been causing me to get like, even if I'm in bed for eight hours, I don't even know that I'm waking up or I wake up. I feel like I wake up three, four times and wake up like 10, 11 times. So I feel like I'm in this constant state of like sleep depri deprivation when I shoot. So I really wasn't worried about the time zone. I was more worried about getting my hours. So getting there three, four days early, uh, I was just going to bed and like clocking 10 hours of sleep a night. So I don't think the sleep factor is that big. When you started stacking the 4 a.m. days back to back or just the early days back to back was a little tough. Um, but the jet lag didn't get me get to me because I was there early enough. Um, but I wasn't. I wasn't crazy enough to change my work schedule to work from 1 a.m. to 9 a.m. or anything like that. It would be cool if I could do that, but um, I just adjusted when I got there. So in your video, mm -hmm. there were pictures of you with animals and things like that. Was that on a shooting day or a non-shooting day? So that was a non-shooting day. And I guess I should also preface this with I'm coming out with my match video. I'm coming out with a match vlog, which is a video log. So I carried a, a handheld camera on like a little selfie stick thing around throughout my entire travels. And I'm also coming out with a breakdown video. I sent them over ahead of time my match videos. So you kind of see what I'm doing. And I just don't want to release that until my breakdown's done, about halfway done with it. It just takes like way too many hours. Um, but yes, uh, so they've seen that. That's why they're mentioning the video. And maybe by the time this comes out, it'll be out potentially. Um, oh, but it that will was be. On, it will We're be. recording on a delay at this point. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. Well, I, I love the confidence in you guys getting it out. I have the, don't have the confidence in me getting it out because I'm a perfectionist. <laughs> I'll record it five times and spend like three days on it of like hours, not just like three nights. Um, but anyways, uh, yeah, that was on the fifth day. So I shot four days. So I, I got there and I had three days um, or two nights in Bangkok to kind of like adjust to the time schedule, sleep. I mean, it's a kind of a whirlwind getting over there. Um, the travel kind of, you know, it's just, mm -hmm. just hard getting over there. You get over there and then you want to settle down for a little bit, relax, get, get adjusted to the food, the um, the time zone, everything like that, sleep a little yeah. bit. So that was good. Saw the temples and everything. How many days did you have? I think it was two or three days. It was two or three Perfect. days yeah. in Bangkok. And then I had three days in Pattaya. So basically I had Monday, Tuesday in Bangkok. Wednesday, I drove to uh, to Pattaya. My dad rented a car, which is a very ballsy move of my dad. And I fully oh, support that yeah. decision. Always get a driver. I do agree with that. But uh, Trevor Cotter said it was fine driving around. And I uh -huh. love his confidence. Yeah, listen to Trevor Cotter. Whatever he <laughs> says, do that. <laughs> you know, some, sometimes a man is right. And it wasn't too bad driving. My dad's luckily a good driver. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, it worked out good. And he drove around. It was nice to have the freedom of doing it, but, um, I'll, I'll take Trevor's confidence on this one and we'll rock around. But, um, Wednesday we got there, checked out all the stages and everything, which is really cool. It got to the match and I felt like I had you know good confidence on those stages. And, um, it was, and I know I'm diverting from the question. We're going kind of timeline, but we'll get to the animals for sure. Um, but it was good <laughs> seeing all the stages and meeting all the people. I mean, I couldn't walk like this is kind of, I mean, Pan Am, I was meeting a lot of people and pictures and stuff. But at, the, at this, I was not really expecting uh, much more than that. But the world show, I couldn't walk like five feet without like signing stuff and taking pictures, which is really cool. Um, it's really cool when it's not during the match, right? But it was cool for sure. So I made sure to kind of make my rounds there. And then, uh, so I saw all the stages and then on the way home, we were pack, pra uh, passing one of the practice, practice ranges. And I stopped in there met the owner of that tactics and gun. And I shot like two or three mags It passed close. She was super nice. Let me do that. Um, so I shot that day. And then Thursday I shot this little pre-match and then Friday I practiced with Jaime Saldinha Jr. from Brazil. And then Saturday morning, I just shot two mags on match ammo with Chris Tilly and Clemente and, um, and then opening ceremonies. And we started kicking off on Sunday. So we had a few days yes. in there, which I think helped a lot and built my confidence because when I first got to Thailand, I mean, I, I feel like I'm a very independent kind of roll the punches, very street smart guy. But like this is it's a little crazy country. There's a lot of stuff going on mm -hmm. and I'm fine with that. It was just like you got to feel a little more comfortable, especially kind of punching out early and going all around and always felt safe and stuff. It's just a lot going on in Thailand. So it was good to kind of feel comfortable with everything, know where everything's at. The silly stuff like where's the grocery store and stuff like that. So I mean, it all worked out good. Land. Totally. Yeah. The reason I asked about the animals is because when you posted it in your video, you did kind of had have sort of 
a hard time getting back into your mental space mm-hmm. in the stages yeah. you posted right after that. So I wasn't sure if that was because you were out touring and seeing animals and then jumped into shooting and uh, had a mm-hmm. hard time getting back there or what happened no. there. Yeah, no, that, that definitely, uh, that definitely makes sense, but I don't think that was exactly it. That definitely could have been something, but I don't think that was the case with me at all. Um, I saw the animals in the morning, the tigers and the, the elephants and everything, but I ended the day getting lo- right back locked in. I feel like a little bit of a mental refresher is good. I mean, you want to stay behind the gun. You want to stay focused, but a little, a little bit of a break after four days of shooting back to back, I think was really beneficial. I think if I would have just seen the animals and like hung out by the beach and then showed up the next day, I think I would not have performed very well. But at the end of that mm-hmm. day, so I, I slept in, got some more sleep because I woke up 4 a.m. the next, the, the last day and I was waking up before the next day. So I got like 10 hours of sleep on that night, which was really good. Woke up, saw the elephants, saw the tigers. And then that afternoon I went and shot, you know, maybe 50, 60 rounds. And I was just like, boom, there we go. A little mm-hmm. bit of the mental fog. I can refocus and kind of get back in touch with stuff and then just shoot. And I felt totally locked in going to bed. I think it was just an approach change on the last day. I mean, I knew I was up by 40 points with six stages left. I don't remember exactly how many points were still left out there, but it would have been, you know, Edsel would have had to connect on every single stage, basically win Mm -hmm. every single stage. And I would need to shoot below 90%. But I think it's pretty difficult to shoot below 90% if you just go shoot alphas at a good pace. So I think it was a strategy change. And I think it was a good strategy change. I think I maybe could have altered it slightly, but um, I think that was definitely a good strategy move. But I don't think it was any like distraction or I don't think it was any like me getting locked out because I was fairly locked in that entire match. Yeah. That's actually something I asked about. I wanted to ask about that is something about like how important to you was the rest day and how seriously did you take it? How seriously did you take your rest? And you just beat me to all that. It's yeah. You made sure you crammed 10 hours of sleep in. you made sure your rest day was not only like a, re- a refresher, but then mentally kind of reset. It's interesting to hear that because most people think mm-hmm. like, Hey, he's a champion. He's probably just hammered to the hammer down, hammer down, hammer down. But like, yeah, four days of shooting Thailand a week down there. Yeah. You needed a, a refresher. Yeah. And it's, it's actually pretty easy for me to, um, to like wear myself out because I'm very high energy and I put a hundred percent effort at everything that I'm doing. Um, so it's pretty easy for me to wear myself out. So sometimes I don't really know I need a break, but I do need a break. So I think that was a good break and it's relaxing. Um, but I definitely think getting locked back in before that last day was super, super important. Um, but yeah, it all worked out. And how important did you think that, uh, beginning match, that warm up match was for, I saw a lot of guys really like that. Yeah, the warm-up match is really good. I had one more note on uh yes, okay, one more note on the last topic. I wished on that on that last day, I think it was Thursday and I finished Saturday. No, it was uh, Wednesday and I finished Friday. I wanted to shoot that PM session and get done with the match. I was locked in, I was good, let's do it, let's do it. But you're at the mercy of the schedule. So I was like, all right. Well, if I have to take a day off, I'm going to do it the right way and relax and then lock back in and take gotcha. that mental kind of refresh a little bit. But yeah, I was like, I'll wake up at 4 a.m. tomorrow, shoot the next schedule. I don't care. I don't care what anyone else does. I need to shoot six more stages, get those scores in. But I had enough confidence to know that if it wasn't going to happen tomorrow because it's a rest day, I'm just going to have to win the match another day, which is, is what it is. I can be patient, but it's hard internally waiting that entire day. And it was very hard for me to relax Mm -hmm. because I knew, I mean, there's actually an Instagram audio. I think it's Bert Kreishner and someone else saying like, I know I'm about to win. I'm about to win. I'm about to do this. So it's like, it's hard because you just want to yell and scream out loud. I just need six more stages. I'm going to go shoot alphas on the rest of these. I know I'm going to win this match no matter what. Like, let's do this. Like, give me the trophy. Let's do it. You know, I just want to, and not just give me the trophy. It's give me the opportunity to go get the trophy right now. I'm ready to do it. Let Let me me finish this. this. I want to go shoot this next stage. I want to shoot this next shot. So that was difficult. But the match um, before the match, um, I think if you would have performed poorly at it, I think it would have negatively affected you. It all depends on your approach too. If people use that as a practice or a warm up, I don't think that's the way to do it. I think it's just kind of adjusting to shooting there. And like, I Mm -hmm. feel like, it kind of knocks out your first stage without knocking out your first stage a little bit. Yes. makes you feel comfortable in that area with that equipment, with that weather, how your, you know, your r- stupid stuff, like how your wrist, when it sweats, when it's a hundred degrees is going to feel on the back of your magwell or on your left mag pouch. It's silly stuff like that. It's just a confidence builder. Um, I think if you go to that match and you shoot very poorly, I think it can mess with your head. I think if you go to that match and you shoot really well, it can mess with your head. So you have to kind of, before you even shoot that match, take it for what it is. So EJ, Ed Salhino was mm-hmm. your biggest competitor. He came in second place. Mm-hmm. And EJ is very, um, he just has one gear and it's go. 
Mm -hmm. And he just brings the speed to every stage. And I watched his videos. He was extremely consistent. Mm -hmm. Where normally when you're just in go mode for an entire, what was it, six days, something's going to fall apart. Stages. And it yeah. didn't. 30 stages. And he stayed consistent the whole mm -hmm. time. Yep. He was a really tough competitor. He was there to win. Definitely. But so were you. Definitely. Definitely. And uh, so to back up on, on Ed Selgino, I think very, very, very highly this individual. I think Ed Sill is an awesome guy. And I I knew he was going to be, you know, a top five, top six guy. And everything I'd always heard about him is he's got this unreal speed, but he always mm -hmm. has that 40 point mistake. He always has those two miss two misses on a stage. He always has that, you know, eight seconds slower on one stage or two stages, drop 60 points and he's out of the match. Right. And so I kind of expected that. And I don't really focus too much on my competitors at the end of the day, what he does, what Jorge does, um, what anyone does is not going to affect my performance. I mean, it can alter my strategy, right? And that's just like playing smart. But at the end of the day, I can only pull the trigger as fast as I'm going to pull the trigger, shoot how I'm going to shoot. Um, but I knew that he had a lot of speed. Uh, I, I just was waiting for his 40 point mistake to then add 40 points to my score, you know, um, or a gap right by 40 points. But I was very, very impressed. He came tuned. He came ready to go. He came ready to play. Mm -hmm. He's an awesome competitor. I think he's a very, very, very nice guy. He said some very kind words yeah. to me. We shared some very kind words, you know, mutually to each other after the match. And that's just between us. But um, and a really incredible guy and a, also incredible shooter, too. I mean, he brought it for six days, right? I stuck to my strategy and I wouldn't change it. I know I would change some stuff, but I would like to think I wouldn't change much with my strategy. And I, and I do a lot of the same stuff again, but I was expecting for him to have that 40 point mistake by the way he was shooting. And the way he was shooting was very aggressive, very mm -hmm. hard exits, um, really hard entries, aggressive entries, mm -hmm. shooting in and out of position. Um, I mean, a lot of the times he would have some deltas, you know, you shoot the corner of the target and you can see light on one side of it, right? You can see it breaks the outside perf. He had some of those and I'm like, he is millimeters, inches away from a miss. It's going to come. It's going to come. But no, he kept together really well. And in high pressure situations when he needed to bring it, he brought it. So I, I, uh, I see Edsel as, you know, what he is, right? The second best shooter in the world. He's an amazing competitor. I expected more of a dogfight with Jorge, um, but I understand there's a lot of factors going on. I understand pressure is a big thing, trying to win the second world championship and uh, shifts the focus and whatnot. Um, but, you know, like like I said about Ed Sell, same thing with, with Jorge. I think the world of him, I think he's an amazing competitor, an amazing guy. And I think being an amazing competitor is two parts. One, just the person you are, how you treat people and how you treat ROs and how you treat your competitors, but it's also how you play the game, um, how you take your calls, how you interact with other competitors. I think both of those guys want the other competitors to do their best no matter what, and they'll take their scores no matter what based off what I've seen with my own two eyes. So I think they're awesome competitors. I just wanted to toss it out there and shout them out. Yeah. Yeah, EJ is very respectful, really good shooter. And he and his wife Definitely. Liz just had a baby not too long ago. I saw some pictures online. I was like, that's a cute baby. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. Stuff. Yeah. So he definitely had a lot going on in the background and was still training and pushing for this. Yeah. And so did you. I mean, everybody yeah. has their stuff. Definitely. Everybody's got stuff they have to train through. But yeah, he he yeah. is a maybe it's being a father. I don't know, a father and a husband now. He's a changed shooter from yeah. the guy I met years ago in the Philippines. Yeah, I don't have a baby, but I think I'm pretty much like baby busy. Like if I had a baby, that's how busy I am. So I could imagine having <laughs> a baby in the next oh, five years. Oh, you just years. wait. <laughs> yeah, right. But I'm, I think I'm baby busy right now. I think I'd have to knock some things off or clear the schedule a little bit more if I did have a kid. But a side note. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he really, he really pushed you. Mm -hmm. And what you're saying about his hard exits, hard entry, everything is just explosive mm -hmm. with Edsel. And with you, your movement is completely different. Mm -hmm. Edsel is one of those fast twitch muscle explosive guys. You're, I wouldn't say slow twitch, like a long distance mm -hmm. runner. You're more like in yeah. between. Yeah. You're not fast twitch. You're not slow twitch. You're just like in the middle. Yeah, I think I just like, I think a lot of the times I've been I'm moving at the same speed or in some instances faster than maybe Edsel or other people that are like very high strung. I mean, I would say maybe a high strung, like high energy guy, like 
when I'm talking and interacting, but like when I'm actually shooting, I'm very controlled. I'm very relaxed. And uh, so sometimes it looks like I'm not really trying and I'm actually am putting an effort. And sometimes it looks like maybe, maybe I was moving slower. Maybe it wasn't moving with all my effort, but I actually am moving very efficiently and very effortlessly with the same speed. And that's because I know from like different sports I've played and the way I break down stuff, you don't always need to be big muscle oriented. You need to move smart and efficiently. And so I, I choose and not saying that Edsel doesn't do this because me personally, I move very efficiently rather than with like maximum effort. And I can also combine max effort with max efficiency. But if you're already max efficient, then adding big grunts and big stuff like that is really not going to help that much. So I think, I think my movement is, is real solid and real good. Um, I just don't need to like exert myself crazy on every single stage if I'm moving with the right techniques and Mm -hmm. applying them in the right different positions. So I choreographed each stage and had everything planned out the way I was loading my body, the way I'm angling stuff, the way I'm entering, the way I'm exiting. And I didn't really need to be big muscle oriented or be out of control. I was very in control and very efficient. So that Mm -hmm. was, uh, that was my strategy. Yeah, your movement's very notable. The The way you move doesn't look, um, like you said, it looks like you're not trying, but it's very, no, it's, I mean, obviously that was a 12 second stage and everybody's shooting in 15. Like, okay, the kid's moving. <laughs> All right. So what's going on? I, I, I noticed that you're, I mean, you're an ex-athlete. How much does that mm-hmm. affect your movement? How much does it affect your training and stuff like that? You think that have, has a big influence on like how low you stay when you're coming into positions and st- stuff like that? Yeah, the the lowness is kind of like my philosophy on the stance. And uh, there's some secrets that lie in that. So I won't talk too much about that. Not really secrets, but just things that I've felt that uh, help my shooting. But as far as the movement stuff, I mean, playing baseball, playing infield, I mean, primarily at the end of my like baseball career, I primarily pitched and played outfield. But when I played infield, a lot of the footwork needs to be very precise, very fast. And if you try to try to over muscle stuff or put too much effort into it, you can actually mess yourself up and, and have your feet go all over the place. So moving very efficiently and with the purpose is the, you know, the goal of what you're doing with your feet. So a lot of middle infield work with my feet and being very in control of my body has helped a lot. Um, so I think that's, it's, it's a nice little crossover and it's sometimes hard to work with some shooters um, that didn't have a sports background because you have to relearn some of that stuff that some, kind of comes naturally yeah. and you really have to plan every single step. And, but um, some of that stuff comes naturally to me, but on these stages, I'm planning every little small detail. If you look at these stages, we're moving in three different distances, learn how to cover those distances, right? Yeah. There's two different types of, and I mean, there's obviously different angles and whatnot. And, and it's part of that is filling in as needed, but having a strategy, depending on yeah. the target and distance, how you want to enter, how you want to exit and how you load your body is super super important so all of that is choreographed like a dance so if shooting doesn't work out i might be a dance choreographer i my sophomore year i did a synchronized swimming uh dg philanthropy (laughs) event that i choreographed videos may service eventually it was beautiful we were swan diving into this fraternity school um but i think i'll stick to shooting anyways that's that's gonna be the intro to this podcast come on actually i'm looking for a video because i choreographed it it was awesome but the like a lot of the girls that filmed it like sent it to people didn't save it. So if you ever catch it's me, they're gonna embarrass into, you, and here you are proud of it. Yeah, if you ever see me, yeah, right. If you ever see me swan diving into a pool with a choreographed <laughs> dance, tossing people in the water and swimming all over the place, save the video just so you know. But I like to hear that athletic <laughs> background though, because like I played yep. lacrosse. So sorry, I know your baseball player is lacrosse player. Big lax, bro. We got that beef going on. Yeah, already. we would have fought in high school. It's fine. But um, it's one of those things where you have to realize like, hey, if I'm going to be throwing to the left while moving to the right, yeah, I can't just be sprinting in that direction. You start to right. orient your how I'm loading my hips, how I'm loading my feet, how I'm loading my upper body, my lower body. And I found that, yeah, mm-hmm. baseball players, I played lacrosse, that helped. I find uh, uh, tennis, uh, yeah. golfers, all that kind of stuff. They have that secret little, oh, I get this from their past. And I'm glad to hear, okay, totally. so it's definitely something that that has leaked into your shooting. It's your ability to stay low yes. and control all that stuff. Yeah, it's controlling stuff and knowing how to generate power <laughs> and generate power, you know, effortlessly and being really efficient. So like my goal with my shooting is be as efficient as possible. I mean, some there's I'm thinking of some shooters right now and I'm thinking of the way how I transition. Some people you, you see them shoot. And you're like, wow, that, that that looks so fast, but they're working so hard and sometimes working against their body and their biomechanics mm-hmm. and just efficient movement in general. And it looks really fast and isn't really fast. In my mm-hmm. opinion, the fastest runs are some of my slowest runs in my they mind. They should look boring. Yeah, they they should look boring and they should look slow because they didn't have to work hard. They're taking yep. the most efficient plane. They're they're doing a lot of things efficiently, right? Yep. So some of my fastest runs, I'm just like, what guys? And they're like, oh, you know, clapping or like, oh my gosh. I'm like, 
what? It was just nice and controlled and nice and efficient. And sometimes I watch people, um, some really highly, you know, very technical, very fundamentally sound shooters. I see them shoot and it just looks slow. I'm like, oh my gosh, was that really two seconds faster? You know? So um, I'm trying to think who would be a good example of that. I think Chris Tilly is one of those guys that sometimes sneaky fast because I think he's learned a lot of stuff. Uh, I think a lot of it's experience base of knowing all the little tricks and all the little Sneaky different tweaks on the stages. And he, he sprinkles those in. And I think it kind of mentions this to Chris at the end of the match. I saw him on a few stages do really efficient things. I'm like, do what you just did. I mean, obviously he, he did it, but he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, that, do that little shoulder turn or do that little twist or open your body there. Like, like I'm doing that now, you know? Um, that's a whole different yeah. thing. How the team worked together was awesome, but, uh, yeah, Until if you let guy. me go, I'm gonna talk about a million different topics just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you mentioned something in there with the, the working hard. I see a lot of people, mm-hmm. like everybody's talking about transitions online and eyes and mm-hmm. this, that, and the other thing. And I'll, I'll leave all that for argument and, and other yeah. podcasts. But what I see, um, I, I see in a lot of your transitions is they look, they don't look slow. They don't look fast. They look just if I were to draw you a transition on a piece of paper, they look exactly like that. And I even notice it looks like on big transition, it looks like you're almost bringing your gun down to the target, regardless of if the targets are side by side. Is that something I'm just seeing because the GoPro videos are like fish eyed or is that something that you can speak on? You know, some you have you have a little bit of uh, of a point there. Sometimes I kind of like rainbow the gun when I don't exactly mean to do so. I think in my transitions, I really like to feel the drive. I really like to feel the call, the shot, and the push off. Which sometimes I exaggerate that, and I think that's some of my training, um, kind of going into the match. Unfortunately, some of that stuff sometimes happens. I mean, sometimes you'll see me have my gun up like egregiously early, like really, really early. And yes, that is a good thing, but it doesn't need to be that over exaggerated. So sometimes I over exaggerate stuff because sometimes when people have a really hard time bringing the gun up i'll just make them put the gun up like way too early because then it starts Mm -hmm. that feels uncomfortable and then what's right starts to feel less uncomfortable because right now what's right feels uncomfortable you make it more uncomfortable and that starts feeling you know a little more comfortable um so yeah there is a point to that but i don't always try to do that i try to just you know have my eyes lead find that spot have my gun meet what i'm looking at and stop on that spot so um but yeah sometimes i get caught over exaggerating some of the stuff and some sometimes that's because when i have a problem like let's say i have a vision problem i will do one or two drills to fix that over and over and over and over and over and over again until i fix it and then sometimes you can overcorrect. so it just that's just how it is sometimes it's interesting though because i like the theory of over exaggerate and overemphasize rather than um, underemphasize. obviously key yeah. always is like hey overrun positions don't underrun positions but it's something mm-hmm. that it, it makes a lot of sense. I, I if anybody's learned from me is listening, I always joke, joke with them, exaggerate. I want you to to shoot like you're acting on stage that you're shooting mm-hmm. USPSA stage, and that generally gets what I want out of people when they're not you get like, the point across. Yeah, because they're not. They're. Like, I want you to act silly, and they're like, "Oh, I tried to act silly, and it was right." See? Mm-hmm. See? Yeah, right. So that like, exaggeration, that that exaggeration of always do it the exact way I was trained, not harder, but exaggerate that mental thing. So I, I, yeah. I see that in, in your shooting, and it's like, all right, all yeah. right, it speaks to totally. Me. Like one more example, and sorry, I know Keita's trying to pop in with something there. One more example of that is sometimes people don't drive off the drive off the target, right? The the bullet leaves the barrel and they're they're lingering too long. And it's like I'm like, well, drive off the gun, drive off that target faster. And they're like, well, I'm, it's the max, it's the max. There's no way I can do it better, right? I'm like, all right. They put their gun out. I hold the bottom of their hands. I'm like, okay, pull the trigger. And as soon as that bullet leaves the barrel, I drive their hands off. I'm like, where did you hit? He's like, no way I hit the target, right? It's still in the center. It's like, as soon as that bullet leaves the barrel, there's such a delay before you then are interpreting what just happened when you can drive off the gun. So you just rip their hands off, not off the gun, right? They hold the gun, yeah, no, rip their gun off of the target. They're like, oh, well, that's the maximum. So you want to get as close as possible to that. And once you feel mm-hmm. that, I mean, if you take the gun off and go bang and rip across, right? Bang and rip across. That's the maximum you can possibly do it, right? The, as soon as the bullet leaves the, gun, leaves the barrel, you're ripping off it. So sometimes you do need to over-exaggerate it and see what the maximum is just to see what, yeah. what you can do. Yeah. I have a drill for that. <laughs> Tim Heron, I'll always remember Tim Heron, like, uh, he, he always gets funny reactions out of that because he does a calling your shot drill and a follow-through drill. And I'll literally just take a shot and just throw the gun that way. And everybody goes, what the and then you try it a couple yeah. times, like, oh, okay, I'm being slow. Man. Totally, yeah, totally. Yeah. I love the little tricks. I love the little tricks like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I'm I'm learning all those as I as I go along a little bit, but most of the time it's self discovery and a practice. And I'm like, oh, that worked, or that fixed my problem, or yeah. here's how you think yeah. about it better. So yeah. that's when the most self discovery to help my teaching, and and that's definitely evolved. And unfortunately, I don't have as much time for teaching anymore. Hopefully, in the more in the future, because I do truly love doing that. 
Um, and it's a lot of fun. And I still get messages from people like four years ago and they're like, I finally, finally got this to work really good. Or, or this has been yeah. working awesome. I get the email of someone who's like, it's so someone rewarding. Who, yeah. You see, like even people, I'm not, I mean, I've only taught some masters and GM guys, but you know, some people made huge strides like C class to master class. And they're like, yeah, I know what I have physical limitations or this or that, but I've gotten so much better and I've taken action on this and I've grown and I've learned this. So it's cool. Um, hope we do more in the future, but the little instructing tri- tips like that have been really cool, especially when they're generated from your own being. I mean, I think a lot of, mm-hmm. a lot of the material is kind of recycled and a lot of people kind of do stuff, but it's cool to find little tricks. I'm not saying that specifically is one, but it's cool to find stuff in the training and then implementing yeah. it. It's, it's been a lot of fun. And there's a lot of times where I think, Oh, well, wish I knew that four years ago or five years ago. And um, yeah. so I create the shortcuts, but sometimes it's too late. Hey, well, <laughs> in two years, three years, you'll probably have your own little training conglomerate that you're sitting on top oh, of. Yeah. Right. And if I had my own kid, you know, that'd be the only thing I could really tell oh, all God. the little secrets to. If I had my own kid and started training him, like what Eric is doing, oh Dangerous. my gosh. I would I would just overwhelm him with all of the all of the, the instructions, but <laughs> good stuff. So before sorry, my lights went out and all good. power and stuff. So you got it fixed. But I wanted to go back to Stage five in the world shoot. I was talking about EJ being super explosive mm-hmm. and you being kind of like medium, not fast mm-hmm. twitch, not slow twitch, kind of in between. And mm-hmm. I watched your first person video. And because it was first person, that made it mm-hmm. hard to tell what you were doing. But I was really impressed how. Okay. So for those of you watching, it's kind of like a J shaped stage. And at the the loop of the J is a uh, two walls that meet separated by a little opening and there's an activator sequence inside so what EJ did was he jumped across to the hook of the J and then ran forward what Christian did was just kind of cut the corner really smoothly without ever jarring his sights and ran right in and just watching your per- first person video, I was like, well, I know he had to have cut the corner or he wouldn't be in that position, but it was so smooth. It was like you were just walking. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's like the efficiency thing, right? Like it's one thing to be, and this isn't like necessarily to how Ed Sol shot it. This is just generically, um, it's one thing to be like super big muscle oriented and like, I'm going to jump this and you really jump across it. But it's another thing to say, Hey, here's a straight line. Here's how I'm going to do this. And here's, I want to have my gun up and I want to roll into position with my gun up, ready to go. Because as soon as my sights are ready, as soon as my body is ready, I know the gun is ready to go. Right. So, um, just took the you know fastest path there and it's interesting. So, um, just setting the scene of this, I've been shooting consistently the entire world shoot. The first day I had a malfunction with my magazine and I had a miss a millimeter into the hardcover. And I was just getting greedy, trying to poke out too many alphas when I should have said, oh, it's okay to shoot a Charlie on this one target, you know, especially with major power factor. Um, <laughs> but I was just getting greedy, wanted to have all the alphas. Um, so I lost like 50, 60 points in the first day. Beside, and I was only down 15 points after the first day. Each and every other day, I added at least 10 points. I won every single day after that two, three, four, won those days. And then I was up by 40 points going to the last day, which is enough where if I just shoot the alphas, don't have a big mistake. Even if someone connects on almost all of those stages, be very hard. That's a very solid lead. Winning by 40 points is you won by a lot, you know, you won by a good, a good chunk there. Um, and so going to that last day, I said, hey, I'm going to shoot the alphas. I'm avoid misses. I'm avoid the ditches. Right. And just shoot the alphas. Um, as fast as possible. And that's it. Stay real consistent. If I need an extra swinger pass, I need an extra swinger pass. Um, but I was doing that and Edsel was having the runs of his life. I mean, I think he won maybe two out of the four stages and the other ones, he was like 97% because he was pushing with the, you know, the push of, if I don't do it now, there's no way I'm winning, right? I'm here to win. And uh, for a lot of, a lot of us, if we're not first, we're last, you know, and mm-hmm. that's not true for everyone. Some people are totally fine podiuming, podiuming and they want to secure their second place. They don't even look at the first place and they want to hold their second place and they'll fend off third rather than try to push for first. That's a whole different thing, but this is clearly not Edsel's approach. He was going, he wanted um, to win. He was he wanted to, to win. win. Yes. And he was going to the wall. And in my mind, if, if I shot those stages, because I'll never put another shooter down. If I shot those stages like he did six times or, you know, those six stages, maybe 10 times, half of those times 
you're going to have a 20, 30 point mistake yep. easily. Yeah. If you're shooting deltas that are, you know, at the edge of the target where half is then exposed to a miss and half is the delta. If you do that 10 times, you're going to miss two, three times at least. Right. But Hey, props to Edsel. He brought it. He shot really, really good. He did. Right. And I had, I had two stages left. So I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to put a little bit more pressure on, right? I'm at, I'm open my acceptable zone to the full alpha. I'm using the full alpha. I was using just the center of the alpha to really make sure I was, you know, that was my acceptable zone that I was shooting at for consistency. I opened it up to the center of the alpha and that allowed me just that little extra speed that I needed to, I think shoot 97% on that stage or something like that. And I put mm -hmm. in a little bit more aggression with what I was doing, still staying very efficient. And I almost won that stage and it gave me like 10 more points back when I wasn't planning on winning a single stage. So I always know that I have that weapon in my pocket and I know that I can bring it out. And actually I built a lot of confidence with that in the past six months and different experiences that I've had. Um, but I just added that little extra touch uh, that I needed no, by no means out of control. That's one I can do 10 times out of 10. But that's what I needed to then gap by 10 more points. But yeah, like, like you just said, Kita, I mean, sometimes it's not about, it's not about shooting crazy. It's not about any of that sort of stuff. It's about taking the most efficient plan and being smart about it. And that's why being a, like a tactician and a strategist on some of these stages and sticking with the fundamentals and what you know is right in the fastest way or most efficient way is what mm -hmm. you want to do. So, you're so exactly another right. thing, another thing we talked about before the world shoot, when we did our matchbook breakdown Mm -hmm. was the steps yes and i talked about how the best way to do that is not to jump off the steps because then you're not in control the steps mm -hmm. if you make contact with each step then you're applying force to that step and it's applying force back on you propelling you much faster than you know 9.8 which is gravity right meters per second squared i mean yep. it's more than that because it's not just gravity you're still using gravity but you're also applying physical force so it's going yes. to be faster to go down the steps touching each step yeah than just jumping yeah no i and totally then you're believe in that. control yeah i totally believe that i think you have all the science behind it and all, all that sounds totally good in the moment i thought by me not jumping off of those steps i thought i was losing time and i was like hey if this is the last stage i'm willing to sacrifice my acl to win this match like i'm okay to jump off this steps possibly risking injury to be faster i think a lot of people thought it was faster what you're telling me makes a lot of sense and i'm gonna go i'm gonna go with that that it wasn't faster and i totally trust that um, but in the moment i thought it was faster jumping off so in that mindset of thinking it's faster to jump off I was still willing to sacrifice a little bit of the speed for the consistency and the longevity of doing this 10 times out of 10 to stay in control and shoot the good second half of the stage and the good second half, third, fourth, fifth, you know, uh, part of the, of the whole entire match. So, uh, no, the logic makes sense on that, but everything that I did in this match was oriented towards consistency and it's, and it's easy for some people to confuse a lack of confidence with an approach. Like sometimes people will say, Oh, I don't know if you take an, not an extra pass on a swinger, but you go one and one where maybe you could have taken two in a pass. Oh, that's a lack of confidence or a lack of ability, but it's like, Hey, if you do it that way and you plan on doing that and you have a miss and you take that 20, 30 second or 20, 30 second point penalty, let's say I lose five at the maximum of me not doing that, that, that way it's not worth risking that. So you're constantly playing risk versus reward and you're embedding that mm -hmm. within your stage plan and your strategy. And let me tell you, on the on the fourth day when I saw Edsel taking some more points to the bank and started chipping away at the lead, did in my heart, did I want to say, I'm so much better than this. Why don't I just go crush these stages like I've been doing this the entire match and go win these stages because I know I can. And that's a confidence thing. And that's like, I want to do that. But in my head, I have to say, oh, wait, Christian, play smart. I know you want to do this. I know you can do this. But you have to play the game smart, yeah. right? Can you and I know do you feel it like 10 out of 10 it. times? But can you do it 10 out of 10 times? And at this point where I'm at in this match with 40 points up, is that really what you want to do? And in my heart, I do know that I would rather go home knowing knowing that I risked it all and I shot to my maximum potential than lose kind of coasting. But in the back of my head, I knew that I wouldn't lose 20 points doing this strategy and I could always pull out of the back you know, back pocket winning any of these stages. So I think I'd still stick to that same exact approach. I maybe would have taken a similar approach that I took on the stage we're talking about, a little more aggression, opening my acceptable zone. But I think the position I was in, I think allowed for that. But with some of the matches I've shot recently and some of the, some of the problems that I've had in some of the regionals and nationals and stuff like that, have shown that I do have that 
win five stages in a row if I need B, right? So it's good to know. Sometimes it's good to push yourself, but I like the strategy that I played with. And uh, yeah, we'll see what happens in the next world shoot. Maybe I come to the last day and I'm down 40 points and I go win six stages to win the world shoot. But I'll do everything in my power not to let that happen. I'd like 60 points going to the last day of the next next world shoot. So we set the goals higher. We try to keep getting better. And uh, that's, that's what we do. Oh, yeah. So at the world shoot, it's always a very, very close match. Usually it comes down to less than a Charlie. Mm -hmm. So when I was watching EJ's video and then your video, first of all, I watched EJ's because he posted them on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And I saw him make that jump. And I said to myself, if Christian didn't make that jump, he's going to win. Luckily, it wasn't that close. Luckily, it wasn't that close. I'll never <laughs> let it get that close. I, and I mean, some people would be like, oh, we won by 13 points. It was really close. But if you see how that match progressed, if you see how the last day progressed, I had complete control of the match since the first stage. So, I mean, you, you got to be there to kind of understand it. You can see the stages. I think some people, um, I'm not saying you guys by any means, but I think some people that aren't as tuned in as you guys can watch the match and you can see it and understand the technicality and things that are going on. They're like, oh my gosh, 13 points. That was so close. And sometimes 13 points is that close but it really wasn't in this match. Um, but yeah, I really tried to make it a no doubter, you know, at any points. And I think this 13 points was a no doubter, but I know the points, you know, 40 will be a more of a no doubter, but it's the control and the modulations you have in the match and the approach. Um, so yeah, I was really happy with how it worked out. There's things I take back, right? My magazine, I think, I think this is the problem because my, my Eddie Garcia guns have never, ever, 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 ever had a problem. And there's a reason why I buy those guns with my own money, because I think they're the best open gun you could possibly buy. And I trust Eddie and he's just like got everything dialed Good and dude. very technical and he, he really does. And, um, but it was a magazine problem that I had. I also had that in the shoot off hmm. with the, with the magazine. So I took it out potentially causing the over travel, something the magazine it's a magazine I don't always use. I thought I was doing myself a you know a good thing by using a mag I've only used a little bit. But anyways, I had a rack at the worst time when the plates disappeared. You guys saw that. I lost 23 yeah. points, I think. 23 yeah. points doing that. And I was like, well, you know, that's what most people would want to win by at this match. You know, I still mm -hmm. came back from that. And people like, um, you know, like Ed Soul didn't have any of those big problems. Not saying gun related, but he didn't have the 20 point loss instantly, right? If anything, it was just, you know, potentially a bad performance on one or nothing glaring, no two misses on something at right. most one, no shoot or something like that. And then I had that one miss that I think cost me 30 something points. So I lost almost 60 points, 50, 60 points on the first day. And after that, I just shot consistent shot the center of the alpha. Like I know how to do, and it worked out pretty good, but um, yeah, I'm just happy that I'm just happy that I worked my butt off. So I could, do, could do this at the world shoot because I think if I didn't train the way that I, I did, I wouldn't have the confidence to go in there and do what I did. And you just wouldn't have the skills to back it up because it really takes a certain level of skills, a certain le level of mental game. And you put those two together and that's what it really takes. Yeah. And yeah. I'm not saying that jump is the reason you want. Oh, yeah. I'm saying, like, <laughs> no, that's I like an analogy. Like that's how that close, close it is. Yeah. It could yes. be the difference between yeah. making that jump and not making that jump, jumping down the steps oh, or not. You or an alpha it to does. a Charlie, it could be everything matters. Case. Everything matters but, by the way you open the door, by the way you shoot, you know, a Charlie or two, by the way you go prone, by the way you reload your gun, the way you drop the start stick to grab something, all the stuff matters. All of it adds up. Yeah. You got you right. So you have to be able to win by such a margin normally that if something mm -hmm. does go wrong like that, you're still going to win. Totally. And we talk about this in my class too, right, Sam? About, your performance bubble, it has to be, if you want first place, you have to set your performance bubble above first yep. place so that 100%. you have this margin in case anything yes. does. Which is what off. I think you were just explaining about to the, yeah. to the layman, the 13 points doesn't look like a lot, but when you put a performance bubble of 40 points up there and you're like, good luck, catch up to 40, do your best. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. So good. So you got 27 points. Good for you, man. Like it wasn't 40. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Uh, yeah. I, I get what you mean by that. And that's exactly what right. you're saying there is you set your performance bubble normally so high in matches that if you just shoot consistently at your normal performance, other people have to way outwork you. It's not, it's about you being consistent and them having to really try way harder. I do. I do agree with that. Yeah. And the most humble way possible. I, th I think that's exactly right. And I think for night, you know, most matches, if you aggregate them and you, you just toss all their match results together and lay them over each other, 
one, two, three, four, five are going to be right within their, their bubbles, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes in individual matches, you'll see people's bubbles overlap, right? So like what I'm picturing in my head is that bubble, right? Where are you actually yeah. perform? And then going higher is, is to the max performance you possibly are capable of. And mm -hmm. below is the lowest or, or maybe like an 85% of what you, you can possibly do. Yeah. It's think, like a Venn diagram. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And if you overlap all of those, of these 10 shooters in this match, I think you, you see a very, very, um, a match to what exactly yeah, we're picturing yeah, definitely. with some outliers of, of people that had really bad matches or had big problems or, you know, connected really, really well, but it's way harder for people to connect really, really well than have that big bomb, which is what you see. I mean, it's reflected in everything um, that we're seeing in these matches. So I think I was by no means close to the top of my bubble. I mean, I had 50 points in, I mean, the miss is my fault and I take complete ownership for that. The jam is too, right? You maintain your own equipment, all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I am the last person to come here and make excuses. I'm a lot, and keep in mind I won. So I'm not making excuses, right? I love how everything turned out, but I hate it when people stack all these things together. Well, I did this, 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 but in reality, it's 50 points that were just stupid, you know? So yeah, it's all good. You also don't want to take away from the performance of your other competitors by saying, exactly oh, well, right. I had a jam and. Well, totally. no, they performed really, really well. Amazing. You did the best you could. Yeah, yeah you yeah. had You're the most consistent. Your yeah. consistency and your performance bubble and everything came together. You said you just come in, nobody else's performance influences yours. It, right. The chips are going to fall where they fall and your performance bubble, like it it worked and that's a big thing exactly i had written right. down you do, took the word out, the word out of my mouth consistency is you right. consistently ran your game for 30 stages where some other some other people had to alter slightly to either catch up or minimize this that or the other thing and then another thing i literally it's funny you just took literally my point you're spot like, on here you're spot on here. One, that day one thing is you had a jam and a miss on day one and then i mean i don't want to say out of character but i noted hey i heard uh, after the jam i heard something i heard a little and i'm like oh wow that's weird that's weird it's because... muted on the real one that's a private video but yeah no you definitely heard that right but it's not it's not like you <laughs> and know now i have it's to not believe like you Sam. DRO, but it's like i never hear a reaction from your videos and i was like oh so that does he is human like all right so everybody can hear like all right there is something <laughs> to being able to deal with that kind of stuff and stay consistent not say next stage i gotta smash it now and do something different consistency consistency yes and you know what's a funny thing so there's a funny thing about that but the other note is Yes, by no means, by anything I say, I don't want to take away from my competitors because yeah. I have never been more impressed with other people shooting than I had been at the world shoot. There's been a few mm -hmm. moments that I've watched people like Casey, Chris, JJ, and those guys in the US. I'm just like, wow, tip my cap to them. That was phenomenal. Uh, you put on a clinic at, mm -hmm. at these stages, right? Sometimes I see them shoot a stage. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I love to think I could do it better and maybe I could, but that was amazing. Right. But I saw a lot of that at the world shoot. And I saw a lot of that from Edsel. I saw him shoot sometimes. I was like, wow, hats off to that guy. But the funny thing I wanted to note was I had never been more confident that I was going to win that match than after the first day. And you may ask why, like you lost 50 points. You're not in the lead, but I was just like, man, everything that didn't want to happen, equipment problems, stupid misses happen, happened. And I'm only 15 points down. Yes, I'm great. so in this. And after that, I felt so relaxed and so at peace with the match. I felt so comfortable. I didn't ever feel that like super hyped up thing after the first stage at all. And I had, you know, normally on my first day of each stage or my first stage of each day, I always had felt that pressure. I never felt at the world shit. I felt so comfortable. And I think that's baked into your training and the consistency thing you were talking about is baked into your training, your mindset. And I think I've, I've done that successfully over the past couple of years, but yeah, I'm real fortunate to have, uh, you know, a lot of support from my family and friends and sponsors and uh, allowed me to kind of explore my training and my practice. And I've learned a lot, which has definitely influenced uh, my performance, which is pretty cool. Yeah. And yeah. I, I know you're not trying to take away from anyone else's performance. Oh, yeah, yeah. Talking about your experience. Just to yeah. be clear on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you're good. You, you guys are friendly. was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. He he has a, a lot to be proud of, and I think he was very happy with how he shot as well. And, and uh, yeah, he was great. He and, shot very well. Oh, yes. man. Yes. I was very impressed with Edsel. I was also really impressed with Chris Tilly. Chris Tilly on the back, like, two days, shot some runs. Did he I was get just fourth like, or something? He got third. Yeah, he got third. third. Yeah, I think fourth was KC. I mean, okay. Chris would like just nonchalantly pull up there and to these stages and just absolutely rip. And he'd still look in pretty good control. And he shot really, really well. And he was able to, to really, really pull some stuff out that I was very impressed with. And it was also just like really cool to share the podium with Chris. I mean, it'll be a moment we probably remember forever. 
uh, I mean, it's, it doesn't matter what's going on in the audience. It doesn't matter anything that's going on. All that matters is like him and I on the podium. I thought that was really cool. And I respect the heck out of Chris. So it was pretty cool. Like, um, it was just pretty cool being up there and we shook hands right after, right after. And obviously we didn't, we didn't need to shake hands. Like it's over or anything like that. It was just like, it was just mutual respect and appreciation for the moment, which is pretty cool. So, yeah. and this tune with the U S team was awesome too. Yeah. Oh yeah. I love how Chris shoots. Like he just doesn't care. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I feel like he doesn't and he does awesome on it. And it's like, come on, man. <laughs> I hate you. I think I told Chris and Casey multiple times. I was like, I was like, what's your time? And I shot him 21, right? What's your time? Oh, 19.5. Oh, I hate you. Just so you know. <laughs> so they had some good runs for sure. Awesome. Yeah. So who who did you meet that you were kind of like fanboying over? I think probably Jorge. I mean, um, I Jorge feel more Ballesteros. Comp- yes, Jorge Ballesteros. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, and I apologize. But I should have taken more Spanish or stayed on my Duolingo. But <laughs> Jorge Ballesteros is awesome. I mean, he's a he's a great competitor and a very, very nice guy. His whole family is. I met his sister. I met his mom and his dad. Really, really cool. Um, you know, I saw Eric again. Eric, I see, is a competitor. And uh, hopefully one of these days he'll he'll pop in the same division that I do. Um, and I'd love to do that. Um, but Jorge was was awesome to meet. I mean, to say I was fangirling might be a little bit more. But I definitely was like, oh, my gosh, this is Jorge. You know, it was really cool to see him. <laughs> um, I was also really excited to see Brody McIntosh. I would watched his videos for a really long time. And uh, I think a lot of the times, uh, this said nothing with Jorge or anyone else, a lot of the times when you meet your heroes, they let you down. And I've definitely experienced that a lot. I know a lot of people have in different arenas and whatnot. But um, and not saying like some of these guys are my heroes, but I mean, these are guys I've looked up to for a while for sure. And sometimes not everyone lives up to that. And I think people like Brody and Jorge really lived up to that of being like really cool competitors, really fair yeah. competitors, and really cool guys. The whole Australian team was awesome. Um, Reese, Reese, Gareth, and then uh, Scotty as well. They're awesome. Like probably the highlight of the squad was one how well the U.S. guys worked together, uh, which I was really really happy with. And I know the I knew Marty that was group together was going to. But I was also really impressed with the Australian team and how we all work together. Um, the Philippines were awesome too. This, this, uh, people from Spain are awesome as well, but we definitely clicked a lot, a lot. And we worked really well together. Part of that is somewhat of a language barrier. Um, we all speak mm-hmm. English as our primary language that definitely helped. Yeah. Um, everyone had good English and everything like that, but you're just, just pretty easy. And just the personality types, I think aligned really well together. So, um, yeah, I think Brody was cool. Scotty was cool. Like I said, the whole Australian team, those are the two guys I primarily worked with there. And then, uh, I was shooting with Bill Drum and he was awesome chris tilly was awesome casey was awesome um jorge the, you know different groups kind of do their own thing a little bit some people work w- with each other i know brody talked to you to shoot with max a lot and work together um me it's like with my u.s guys and running things with and we do something called the stupid check right before we go up and shoot because some of us um are sometimes challenged and sometimes we can be amazing and shoot really good but sometimes we'll like forget targets and whatnot and that just cannot happen so i'm like all right I do this, 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 this. And we all kind of work together to have our best performance. And I think any of us between uh, the Australian team, the U.S. team, I speak very confidently about them. I can't really speak for the for this team from Spain and the Philippines. But I think we'd all be lying if we said we didn't shoot some of the best we possibly could because how much information mm-hmm. we share between us. I think that was really cool. I'm not one that wants to win on having the best stage plan. I'm not one to win that says, hey, guys, if you hook your foot here, you don't have to shoot with your weak hand, right? When something like that comes up, I go up there first and I say, hey, everybody, look, you can do this. Look, I found this. I don't want anyone else to know, right? So I want everyone to shoot their best. And I think that was uh, the coolest thing is the camaraderie that we shared in our squad. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy how you're in what other sport do you help your competitors? Oh, your gun broke here. I got an extra spring. Right. What other sport is that ever going to happen? It's a big thing that I like. You said so like you, you, you've yet to be let down by your heroes in this sport or heroes. I know what you mean, but it's the same thing. Like in all this is in every other competitive atmosphere I've ever been in. I've, I've raced bikes and skis and other stuff. And they'll like watch you like not screw in something right. I'm going to get them. And meanwhile, I've had guns break at nationals and somebody hand me a rifle and be like, no, 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 shoot, shoot, shoot. If I'm going to beat you, I want to, I want to beat you. Like stuff to go down. You're exactly right. Those those team it, it means a lot at these major matches to have a squad that you jive with. If, if, definitely, I, mean, I found that a lot, but it sounds like it's coming a lot from you. Yeah, definitely, I completely agree with her. Chalk that. No, definitely, most of the people in shooting a lot. Everyone in shooting has been really awesome, and and so it was a really good squad. But yeah, some of my heroes have let me down, but I, it was really cool to see some of my heroes at 
at the world shoot be even yeah. cooler than I thought, you know, I thought everyone would be kind of, you know, whatever, but everyone was super cool. And yeah. I thought some of the people that I met were, were some of the, the best experiences of the match and the, probably the moments we'll remember the most. Yeah. I was so happy to see JJ get first. Me too. He's, I was stoked. He's come in second so many times. And he deserved it so hard. Yeah. He he earned that. He totally deserved that. I was so yeah. happy to see him get first. Yeah. No, I was Another super person... excited. Oh, sorry. Just a note. JJ and I are very competitive and we shoot against each other a lot. And, you know, we're really competitive with one another, but I'd be lying if I said I wasn't happy for him. I was extremely happy for him. Yeah. And it's like I told him, I was like, we'd be best friends if we weren't competing against each other all the time. <laughs> right. You know, and I think he's a really, really cool guy. But um, yeah, no, it was it was nice on the second to last day. We had that little break and we were sending uh, we we're showing each other videos and whatnot. And so that was kind of cool to work together. I'd also be lying to say I didn't want him to shoot open. I did want him to shoot open. I love mm -hmm. more competition. I love shooting, competing with him. It's always a pleasure to share the same range with him, especially in the same division. So, yeah, I want everyone to shoot open. I want everyone to shoot in my division. And it's a letdown if everyone doesn't shoot in, in my division because I want to shoot against everybody. I want the best competition. I want the the most pressure. Um, yeah, most competition at the end of the day. But I was You're very not happy the guy looking for the new limited optics title. You're saying, no, nah, nah, bring it. That's no, guy, yeah. and I, I'm not. I'm not just directly after champions. I'm not directly after you know championships, but I'm after champions and championships. I want. I want all the competition. I want. I don't want to win because someone else was somewhere else. I mm -hmm. want to win because mm -hmm. I'm the best shooter in the world. Period. And so oh, yeah. I, I, I challenge the competition, and I love competing with them. And I have so much respect for the the effort and hard work that they put in, and all the people that have come before me. So it's just an honor to be able to shoot with all them. Okay. So another person I was really happy to see get a title was Little Morgan. Oh my gosh! Yes, love Morgan. She is she is a little rock star. I mean, yeah, she's she so cool. Mm -hmm. she's, she's the awesome. same age as my daughter, so she's, I'm just like is it 16? <laughs> Six, 15. Oh, 15. sixteen, fifteen. Sorry, that's right. Fifteen. I know, crazy. She shoots like a very world mature, champion. Yeah, mm -hmm. fifteen year old world champion. She shoots like she shoots so much more maturely beyond her years. The way she mm -hmm. interacts with other people yeah. and, you know, mm -hmm. the way she, she conducts herself is like way beyond her years, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. I think I definitely had to have that when I was younger because you're throwing a bunch of dudes, but especially as a female, and there's not as many of them in the sport. You know, she really holds her own really, really well. Yeah, really um, and uh, it was pretty cool because um, I taught a class down in Biloxi, Mississippi, and her and her dad took it and they're an awesome family. And it took mine that, too. Oh yeah. That's awesome. And you can tell that she uh, she listens very, very well. And yes. I'm sure I had very similar instruction. I never took your class or a formal class when I was younger, but I definitely had some instruction that probably went in one year and out the other. But she's very actionable on stuff. And um, yeah, so I'm really impressed with all the work that she's put in, all the development she's put in. I think notably in the past year, year and a half, she's made two really big changes and it's her setup and it's her stance and her grip and her stance and grip allow her to shoot that gun so much faster with so much more control and consistency. And those two things together have made her so much better and she's made everything better. Right. But those two mm -hmm. changes are just like huge fundamental changes that are so instrumental to your success. And she's totally got them unlocked. So it was funny because this is a very, very true story. Um, I've always been dreaming of the winning the world championship and having the flag and everything and whatnot and, and you know, having the trophy. But I was like, and, you know, big boys and big, uh, you know, big champion stuff, only never cry, all this sort of stuff. But when you've worked your, you know, your entire adult life or however long I've been alive, right, for this, it's definitely an emotional thing to win this trophy. And there's so much in the line. I put my entire life on hold to win this, you know, to a certain extent. Um, it's a definitely an emotional moment to win it. And it's not just me. It's my family supporting me, primarily my mom and dad who helped me tape targets at you know, late nights, early mornings and help, you know, load ammo sometimes and help prepare the gear. So it's not just me that I'd be letting down losing. And I know they said, yeah. oh, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be let down if I lost, but there's a lot riding on this. But it's funny when Morgan went up there and had that, that flag wrapped around her and got the trophy, you know, someone was cutting onions back there. I'm not talking rolling down, <laughs> but let me just tell you, I just shot a bunch of, you know, saline in my eye to get like a, you know, a, I don't know, an <laughs> eyelash out or something. But I, I did not cry when I went up there, which I no, was no. surprised about because, uh, I was really happy for her. And even yeah. JJ walking up there with the flag, I was like, good stuff. So. That was a cheer jerker seeing J JJ get up there. Yeah, he, definitely, he, definitely both. He deserved that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you guys all represented us damn well, man. That all of awesome. you. Like, I watched all of you get up there. I'm like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> yep. yep. Totally. Totally. 
Yeah, it's pretty I'm cool. I'm so invested. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's like you're watching your favorite TV show. <laughs> sitting totally. back here in the US in my living room like who's up there who's up there oh right my God. <laughs> I wish they I wish they would have done a little bit more like live stuff because I had you know 100 200 people back home that all wanted to watch and all want to yeah. support so that's the only bummer they kind of like live play by play and updates and all that sort of stuff yeah. but uh, there's no reason not to get political because I'm very apolitical the USPSA stuff because I just have too many balls in the court to get really involved with that at this point in my life. But yeah, it'd be cool if we could make could blow this up a little bit more because you really have something really cool and really special here. So that's a sign. I think now. so too. Yeah, mm -hmm. but you I mean, smart if people, people are gonna watch Jersey Shore. Why wouldn't they watch this? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you gotta be a little bit of a USPSA. No nerd, offense, but Sam. No. <laughs> But I know Bill Duda is coming out with his whole – he's doing all the match videos and stuff, or at least for Area 8. I don't know how far he's getting with that. And I'm seeing that be a huge, huge addition to our sport. I mean, with the technology and everything, you're definitely right. They're so It's so cool to watch. If we can just get more people to look at what we're doing, it's enamoring. I show people who have no idea what guns are, and they're like, that's really cool. You could do that. Yeah. Do you so, remember, I remember mean, Max – look at – Sorry, sorry. You remember Max Michelle yes. Hot Shots? Remember Hot Shots and they yes. throw yes. around? They throw Max Michelle around. That was the coolest thing. I, I told Max so, at opening ceremony, so we, were, we were walking together at the early part of it. And I, I told him, I was like, you know how many times I've seen you watch or win the world shoot on Hot Shots? Like I couldn't even count on my hand. I've watched that maybe ten plus times, you know. And I've that's one of the things, you know. Side note: early success. I've studied everyone. I've analyzed everyone. I've watched every video there is out there, right? I guess I probably should take more classes. That might have been also a help. But um, yeah, I watched Max on the World Shoot 10 times. That video is awesome, right? So I tried to do my own with my little camera that's sitting here. And I got a you know 4K uh, vlog camera for the match. But there's only so much I can do with how mm -hmm. busy I'm doing and all the stuff that's going on to do it. So it'd be cool if someone else did that. Uh, maybe next, I mean, I think some people had some film crews that they brought over to, to do that, but it would be pretty. On, Bill pretty Duda. Sure. I know. Come on, get on this. I believe in him. Bill Duda can do right? it. Can yeah. do it. I, think, I think USPSA should do it. Well, I mean, Nashville's at least within the U S and then for the world shoot. Yeah. 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 Now it'd be, maybe it'd be for good nationals sure. in the world shoot, maybe some area matches. I mean, totally. Yeah, no, there's uh I'm sure we could find a way to pay for it. And I'm sure if I find a way to do it, because I think a lot of people would support that. I mean, I would pay to watch that at home. I yeah, mean, right? I don't know, start tossing out some numbers and how high we go up individually to start buy, you know, buying a, a play by play and watch people shoot. But I mean, people are, yeah. are eating popcorn and having little like parties watching the nationals on their practice right? court at home. Yeah. What if they had it filmed? I mean, come on, it'd be yeah. pretty cool. But I don't I don't want to get into politics of USPSA. I'm very removed from that at this point in my life. Maybe when I'm older, I think with some of the business background and my experiences personally, I think I could do a lot of good stuff for USPSA. By no means is that any precursor to me running anytime soon for any position. <laughs> I, I have a lot of respect There's for people who take their free time and donate it to the sport and put in a lot of work. So uh, definitely, you know, thank your directors and and uh, you know elected officials that are putting in the hard work for that. That's my yeah, this could, <laughs> this could be like our USPSA Super Bowl, our version yeah. of the Super Bowl. Yeah. And we can have our little Super Bowl parties, eating our popcorn, yeah. watching totally. Christian, I know a bunch of JJ, and Morgan. I literally do. I know else. a group of guys who would gladly sit and come, come to yeah. the, there and drink some beers and watch guys shoot rather than watch football. And hey, if I mm -hmm. wasn't shooting the national championship, and let's say it's a division I don't shoot or something. I'm training for open for the world shoot and it's limited nationals. Heck, I get that out on the mic and I do play by play and interview people and give you a technical analysis there of what go. I saw and where they're at and where's your head and all sort of stuff. I'd ask the right questions. You, you, That's you, great. There you go. Betcha, but yeah. Coming soon. Coming soon. Yeah, that would be great. So is there anyone you'd like to give a shout out to? Any companies who support you or just I know you talked about your parents, obviously, yeah, yeah, your biggest supporters. Definitely. No, so definitely. So like I said, my parents are my biggest supporters, my mom and dad. I mean, couldn't do it without them. It would, it would at least be way harder, like 30 times, 40, 50 times harder. Um, but they're awesome. They supported me. They came to Thailand with me, which is really, really cool. I got to share this experience with them. Um, so it was really, really awesome. And my mom and dad have put in a lot of work. My mom had a really bad knee injury, broke her patella, and she was at the Pan Am Ooh. hobbling around, you know, uh, oh. and just, just getting after it just because she wanted to come and be there, which is really, really cool. And my dad has helped me with a lot of the ammo stuff, a lot of the prep, my tra the training and stuff. And, you know, swingers are hard to set up, steel are hard to set up. And he's mm -hmm. been really generous to meet me after work, after working way more hours than any of us work. And he goes out there and is setting up steel and changes, changes out by the car and comes, comes help me set swingers and everything. So definitely really, really appreciate their help, which has been really cool. Um, 
as far as my gun stuff, it works really well. I, tr I trust Eddie. Eddie's guns work amazing. I got my SIG Electro Optics on top. That thing's never let me down. Really, really crushing it with that thing. As far as all my ammo, real confident with that. I shoot Starline Brass, Everglades Projectiles, all loaded on Dillon Precision. Every single round that I shoot's on a Dillon Precision Press. Um, let me think. Techwear. You see this jersey here? Pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. I bet if you asked uh, Joe Procopio at Techwear for one of these nice jerseys, you could buy one. Have, you know, your signature Christian Silo World Championship jersey. There's only seven of these in the world, actually. I don't know. Maybe you'd make an eight for eight for yours. Maybe like unofficial on it or something you have to write. <laughs> but I think Jorge Ballesteros <laughs> has one. Eric has one. Jaime Saldinha Jr. Shout out to Jaime. Jaime Saldinha Jr., Brazilian. I know in the U.S., maybe not a lot of you guys will know him, but if you pay attention to the beasts around the world that are crushing it in U.S. Mm -hmm. or in IPSC, Jaime's up there. Awesome person. I practiced with him in the match and or the practice match and the and the we had a practice session before. Really cool guy. Just the most humble, just stud you'll ever meet. Really, really cool. Um, TiVo Sports. I use their thumb lock on my gun. Um, I, I don't have it on my CZ that I have right here, but I have it on my CZ, which is pretty cool. I have it on my open gun. It's pretty cool. So I like using the, the stuff that works. And, uh, I really like that as of course, double alpha. I use all their equipment on my belt and everything. Saul was there for my, uh, my last stage, which he, he admitted to me. And I also told him I didn't need a second pass on the swinger and I could have won by, you know, seven, eight more points if I wanted to. But, uh, like I said, consistency, I have this in the bag. There's no point in risking it due to ego or what you could possibly do. And then Bellevue Gun Club is the local range I train at and they supported me. And uh, whether it be the kind messages that they send or the 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 massive first class five-star facility, they they open up to me. So um, those are some people I want to want to thank. Um, there might be someone I'm missing in there, but I really appreciate all the sponsor support. My friends, I'm living with uh, four of my best friends or three of my best friends here. I got two more houses full of guys and guys that moved away from my fraternity <laughs> and my PC that I absolutely love to death and have really supported me and having good friends that support me and, and believe and in me. And they're being quiet. Oh, I did text them. Uh, they sent me some memes about when I told them be quiet. I'll have to read later, but I'm sure they were uh, <laughs> they were poking me a little bit. And um, and then my friends, uh, some of my buddies all around the country, they know who they are, who've been a real support. So it's a team win. There is so much that needs to go right to win this world shoot. Not only does all your stuff need to work, not only do you need to work on – you know, the top, top degree, there's a lot of prep that goes into it. It's not just you fly to this match to show up and shoot. There's so much prep work. And uh, yeah, I will also have to be grateful to myself at the end of the day for putting in all this work, but I can't be naive enough or super enough to think that this wasn't a massive team win. So yeah, it's a dream come true. I've worked incredibly hard, uh, but here's the thing at the end of the day, I love the grind. I'll always tell you it's a grind. I'll always tell you it's a lot of work, but I truly love the grind. Sometimes I wish, you know, when you're at the match pressure and you're just getting, it's all on you. There's so much riding on it. Sometimes you're like, you know what? That practice thing is really fun to do. Maybe we should just practice, right? But obviously taking the test is the coolest part. But yeah. I love the grind and that's what makes it, you know, doable for me. I love grinding. I love putting in the work and I love growing my skill set. I'm going to continue to do exactly that. What's next for me? Who knows? I'm still setting my sights. If you look at a little list that I wrote at the MGM Junior Camp when I was 13 years old, Max Michelle was a speaker, said, write your goals down. I wrote some outside shooting goals, and I have one little sheet here. It's about that big. It says, win a local match, win a state match, win a, win a sectional match, win a regional, and then win a national championship. At the top, there's a win a world championship, a little scribbled on trophy that looks awful. And I just crossed off every single one of those. What comes next, we'll know. But, uh, you know, we'll never know until it happens. So. Times two times three. So you, That's what's going to be on Right. Now. Times ten. <laughs> Yeah, there we go. You heard it here. So you mentioned the jersey. Um, those of you who haven't been to an international match, it is tradition to exchange jerseys with people from other countries. And I saw this really touching moment. Who did you exchange your jersey with? Jorge. I changed it with Jorge and Eric. But I think the coolest jersey exchange was with Jorge. Uh, I'd been... I remember to bring a jersey, but we both were out to change it. We both had jerseys in our bags, the, not the entire time, but basically up to the last day to exchange it. And we finally did it at awards. And it was pretty cool because I just shook his hand and, and told him what, kind of what that meant to me. And, and likewise, vice versa. And it was a pretty, pretty cool moment. And we changed the jersey. He's like, let's get a picture of this. So I was like, yeah, great idea. Way smarter than I was in that moment. Um, but it was pretty cool. It took a cool picture of us changing the jerseys. And I got nothing but good, good things to say about Jorge for sure. Yeah, that that – that was touching because he is the previous open world champion mm -hmm. and he held that title for five years mm -hmm. because of COVID mm -hmm. the world shoot was delayed two years, which adds an immense amount of pressure 
because totally. you've been training for this one match for five years instead mm-hmm. of three years, which is already totally. a lot. And he'd been stomping so, people for those five years. I mean, I haven't yes. seen him in the U S and we'd never crossed paths, but it wasn't like, it wasn't like he won this world championship and just, you know, fell asleep. This guy was stomping people at all matches across the, across Europe, across Asia. He was really crushing it. So it was, it was a pretty cool experience to shoot with those guys. And I think still a lot of that match, what are we like a month out from that match? Still a lot of that stuff really hasn't even hit me yet, but everyone saw all these stupid stuff like driving or falling asleep. I'm like, wow. That was pretty cool, you know, shooting against Torre, going to World Championship. I still really haven't, like, celebrated, celebrated. I mean, my friends threw a little party when I was back here and everything. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. It just for me, it's the grind was the cool part and the fun part. And winning it was mm-hmm. kind of just this is what's going to happen at the end. So it's a pretty cool experience and feel grateful. And, uh, yeah, the match was was very, very cool. So for our listeners, you can go back to last season, 180 Firearms Training Podcast and watch the podcast with Jorge. You were interested in hearing from him as well. I thought you were going to, yeah, listen to Jorge for sure. Listen to Takita's podcast here, the 185 Arms Training Podcast. But also, I thought you were going to mention, listen to me, what, a year and a half ago, two years ago? It was oh, all, it was very technical, a lot of mindset stuff going on and everything. Um, that was pretty cool. I, I've, I'm, I've had a few really long you know, road trips and stuff just by myself or two hour drives that I've called everybody that I want to call. So I'll toss on old podcasts and listen to them, mostly other people, but every once in a while I listen to some of the old little sound bites and stuff like that. It's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, I remember doing that and just, you know, ha- has much changed? Has the mindset changed that much? I don't really think so. I mean, um, kind of pretty much. No, the you same. did exactly what you said you were going to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You stuck no, to it. Yeah. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool for sure. And while you're checking out the Jorge Ballesteros podcast, and while you're checking out the last podcast with me, you should check out, by the time this airs, my match video. My match video is very cool. I don't think there's another world champion that's ever posted all 30 stages and showed you it before. Um, Not just do I post all 30 stages of it. I also post a vlog that takes you through the entire match. If you're going to go to a world shoot, uh, you know, or you just want to see it because it's awesome. The play-by-play of me training the last days before I leave, hanging out, shooting, the whole match process. Check out the vlog. Oh, yeah. um, but if that's not enough and not a huge advantage for you to get better or have awesome entertainment, there's a match breakdown video. I was just, just going to say, what other world champion breaks, you know, shows you all 30 stages? Zero. This is Look how to beat me. Here's yeah. here's how to beat me. Here's a strategy. Here's what you can learn from it. <laughs> and it's in only a few bucks to do it, right? So, um. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, I break we'll, down every we'll single stage. We'll link that all in this end. We'll, we'll link oh, that all in, right that. in the I appreciate podcast. that. Because it'll probably, we'll, we'll we'll wait for you to post it before we post this one. We'll, we'll be talking <laughs> about it. It'll be quick. I, I, we'll I, give I, you some time. We know. I we, spent we, like 20, 30 hours on it. Hopefully I'll finish it maybe in the next few days. But I break down every individual stage, the mindset, all the little tips and tricks um, that I kind of talk <laughs> about. And I definitely embed a That's lot of awesome. stuff in there. I'm not going to give you a full class in there, but it might as well be a little crash course on a lot of really important stuff. So it's sure. pretty cool. I wish I could see another world champion break down their 30 stages. You probably will never see it. You'll have to go watch a world championship to see it. But I filmed mm-hmm. it on my head cam. I filmed it, filmed it third person, two different angles and posting it. So go check it out. Put a lot of hard work into that sort of stuff. And uh, not just in the video editing, but the training too. I take that pretty seriously from now and again. <laughs> yeah, thank you for doing that. Look at Christian giving back to the sport. <laughs> what about it? No secret. Oh, with the video, with the be- with the video. Yeah. I was like, "What are you talking about? Roing matches, setting up stages, or no? That is giving back yeah. to the sport because to do you're that stuff. taking away from your mental focus to even just have to do this. Click that hat cam. That one thing that you have to remember ready, to do before the stage yeah. when you're supposed to be visualizing and focused. Oh, just yeah. that one little thing." You're yeah. taking away from your own match to give back to the sport. Yeah. And obviously, there I'd be lying to say there isn't any financial incentive because I am selling the video, right? But yes, it is pretty cool to share. And I also take the, the video because there's a lot of other stuff I can share with some of my friends and kind of the cool moments from the match, which is pretty cool. But yeah, I like to be able to share. Like I said, I want... I want to be beaten by someone that shoots their best and I want to beat people when they shoot their best. Right. So uh, that's how I want it is. I'm free. I'm not going to come up to you and say, Hey, you're, you're, I mean, maybe I actually would, Hey, you're forgetting this target, but I want everyone to shoot their best. And, and that's how I want to win. I'm never going to pull anything fishy with any of the targets. I'll always shoot my, you know, my fair score. Uh, I always treat people with respect and that's how I want, want to do it. But mm-hmm. side tangent for where we were going there, but same sort of vibe. Yeah. Yeah. And Sam and I both saw, your shooting video it's definitely worth worth watching definitely <laughs> check it out 
Not bad. Well, I appreciate that. But yeah, well, good stuff, guys. Really appreciate you guys having me on. A real fun podcast. And uh, yeah, I've had a lot of stuff just going on in my head thinking about this match for forever. So good to get it out, you know? Yeah, Yeah, seriously. Thanks for coming on and sharing all that stuff. It's a lot of, a lot yeah, of, thank in, you so much. There's a lot of tiny things in here that people can mine out, but more than anything, congratulations. Thank, thank you, you for representing it. our country. Yeah. Like you guys did, you, you crushed it out there and it's, it's awesome to be able to talk to you about it. Appreciate it. Pleasure meeting you. And it's good seeing Keita again. Always a pleasure. Yeah, you too. If you enjoyed this video, please like, and subscribe. And check See out his videos. <laughs> Do all that. <laughs>